Okay, let's talk about image quality. So, there's a bunch of different factors that can affect the kind of image that we're getting, right? Um, and a lot of them are, are operator control. We have some control over it. Um, a big one in CT is going to be MA, the milliampere level. Victor should be, have talked to us some about that. Another thing is scan time. We can lose contrast if we, our scan times are too long. We can scan past our, our contrast if our scan time is too short, right? Field of view is going to affect things. And that relates back to that formula we were looking at earlier, tying it to pixel size. Field of view over matrix equals the pixel size. So how we told the scanner to include the field of view is, is going to affect the images. It, when we're talking about PET CT fusion, we're pretty much just going to be cranking that field of view out to the maximum thing because, again, y'all have a bigger field of view. Um, the reconstruction algorithms, just the quality of the computer programming is going to affect things. Now, that's not necessarily in, within my control, but it is part of the manufacturer's parameters for the machinery. And they're even coming up with algorithms now that help us um, alleviate some of the streak artifact for metal, and they're coming up with re like uh, iterative reconstruction algorithms that allow us to decrease patient dose. Um, kilovolt peak and then pitch, especially uh, well, only when helical mode is used, there's going to be the pitch, and pitch is going to uh, it's going to be a scanner parameter that we can change, and that's going to influence the quality of our images. So let's talk about milliampers and scan time. A lot of times in X-ray we're referring to this as mass, um, and it's going to be our total X-ray beam exposure. So it's both milliampere applied over a, a duration of time, right? The higher the mass allows for a shorter scan time. So as I crank up my MA, I can drop down my seconds, right? Um, and a short scan time is critical to avoiding uh, any kind of image de degradation due to patient motion. It's not necessarily going to decrease my patient dose because I had to crank up my MA to account for the shorter time. All right, tube voltage or kilovolt peak. A lot of times we call it KVP. This defines quality or the average image of the X-ray beam. X-rays come out of the tube and the CT scanner like a rainbow. There's every possible um, energy level of the X-ray spectrum. We can't see the rainbow, right? But there's going to be different energy levels within that. The kilovolt peak tells us what is the maximum energy that we've given the machine the ability to make, right? And then there's going to be a spectrum of energy beneath that kind of a range beneath that. Um, KVP and CT is not really, we can't really think about the way we think about KVP in, in radiography. Um, and typically KVP is going to be a little bit limited. We're going to have kind of some buttons that we just click. We say, I want this to be 100 KVP or I want this to be 120 kVp. Most scanners, those are your two choices. So, of course, both those parameters are directly related to patient dose. Um, making sure that we appropriately select mass and kVp is critical to an optimized radiation dose um, and image quality. Now, if I was just focused on radiation dose, I could crank the MA and crank the KV, I could crank the MA down and crank the KVP up and get you some really crummy pictures, right? I would have a really low patient dose, but I would have a bunch of pixels, right? So when we're talking about dose in CT, the best way to think about it is optimization, image optimization. What, how much bang can I get for my buck, right? If I'm going to dose the patient this much, what, are my, what is my image quality going to be as a result of that? 
So low dose is not necessarily a good thing if I miss that pancreatic tumor, right? I need to have an appropriate dose to diagnose whatever I'm looking for. Um, so it's a pretty flexible thing, but at the same time we need to be thinking about image quality, image quality, image quality, and not necessarily saying, well, this is the way we've always done it, or um, even in a well-intentioned way saying, I'm going to decrease patient dose. Well, what, does you, what do your pictures look like as a result of that? There is what we call an uncoupling effect. Um, she calls it an uh, uncoupling effect. In digital radiography, we talk about dose creep. I like dose creep better just because it sounds creepy, right? Um, what she's saying is that when we're using digital technology, um, the image quality doesn't appear to be directly linked to the dose. So the CT has algorithms that it can apply to give us kind of an average set of pictures regardless of the dose. For example, in digital radiography, just last night I went into the lab, I took a hand x-ray on film. At uh, the mass for that hand x-ray was 2.5, which is an appropriate um, mass for a hand x-ray, right? Then I multiplied that mass by 100, and I took another film x-ray and totally burned the film out, right? Totally burned the film out. Nothing was visible. You could barely, barely, barely see the right marker on it. You could barely see a piece of metal on it. Um, conversely, I took my CR plate, I took a digital system, right? I took a digital technology, put my hand on it, cranked it up to 250 mass, took an x-ray of it, and got a beautiful picture. I exposed the patient a hundred times more than they needed to be exposed. But the digital technology, because of how it samples, was able to get me a really pretty picture, right? This is what we call the uncoupling effect or dose creep, that there is a tendency among technologists toward laziness, basically, and that laziness translates to an increased patient dose, right? Um, so be aware that CT physics is slightly different from digital radiography, um, and we need to be aware of how dose optimization works in CT. Um, one really, really important case about this is cedar sinai People still talk about cedar sinai If you look it up, Google cedar sinai brain CT. What happened was they, they had a CT, came out of the package, brand new CT scanner. They installed it at the hospital. They started doing per, uh, CT perfusion studies of the brain. And then three or four months later, they started having patients coming back saying they lost all the hair around their head right here. They had not optimized their dose for the scan. They were getting beautiful CT perfusion studies, which just scan right here, right through your eyes and through the circular willis and tell us how, perfusion, how the brain is perfusing with blood. Um, but they had not optimized their dose appropriately and as a consequence, the people had lost their hair. There had been appellation, or what do they call it? Is it appellation? Hair loss. Allo allo alopecia. alopecia. Um, caused by radiation, right? So that would be an uncoupling effect. Scary stuff. So automatic tube current modulation. Most CT software is going to automatically adjust the, M the MAS to fit the specific anatomic region. It's going to be reading what it's picking up. It's going to feed that back into the, into the loop, and this will result in a decrease in dose of about 15 to 40% um, without degrading the image quality because it's telling you what it's getting. Okay. Slice thickness and field of view. This relates back to what we were talking about earlier. When we're talking about image quality, we're primarily interested in slice thickness or how the data was acquired rather than the image thickness, how the data was reconstructed, okay? So slice thickness is going to be that raw data, 
image thickness is going to be the reconstruction that we got from that raw data. Okay? The scan field of view, the field of view, is going to determine the area within the gantry for which the raw data was acquired, right? And then the display field of view determines how much and what section of the collected raw data is used to create an image. So all this ties back to our pixel size, right? All this ties back to spatial resolution. All this ties back to image quality. Let's talk about algorithms and pitch. We're going to choose specific algorithms, and that is going to affect how the scanner filters through the data in the reconstruction process, and it can only be applied to that raw data. Right? If I get a big, a, a big crummy bunch of data, no amount of algorithms are going to pull out something useful from that data. But if I get a nice, clean set of data, I can then choose appropriate uh, algorithms, and it's going to reconstruct out good, pretty pictures. But I want to make sure it's the right algorithm for the data. For instance, I would not necessarily need to do lung windows on an abdomen right, or a pelvis. There's no reason to apply that, that reconstruction algorithm to that raw data set. It's not going to give me any additional information. Pitch. So again, as we mentioned earlier, the relationship between slice thickness and table travel per rotation in the helical scan acquisition is what we call pitch. And where it relates to slice thickness, it's going to affect the image quality that we can get. As the pitch grows, we're going to lose some of our image quality. We're also going to lose the ability to do things like reconstruction, reformats into other planes and stuff like that. So, scan geometry. And again, we talk this, some of this is review, but the tube is going to arc during acquisition for each slice. In the SimTix homework, it talked about a translation. It's going to make a translation, a complete rotation around the gantry. A full translation, uh, 360, 360 degrees is very common. Sometimes we might do a partial translation, right? Um, this was more common with like kind of a fan beam CT. Then we might overscan. This is going to allow the scanner to directly overlap. It's very uncommon, but we may do it with things that um, we need very, very nice high spatial resolution. And typically, though, we can reconstruct and make up the gap in the data. We don't need to actually irradiate the patient more. If we just have a correct understanding of how reconstruction works, we can interpolate for that data rather than overscanning for the data. Image quality, right? It's going to apply to all types of image. So even nuke med images, we're going to call. We're going to. There's going to be some way to determine if that's a quality image or not, right? Um, and a, a, one of the most straightforward ways that we can think about image quality is to compare it to the actual object. Now, granted, a lot of the objects that we're taking pictures of are completely visible to the human eye, right? Um, but nevertheless, quality is going to be a subjective notion for just that reason, right? Um, because it is dependent on the purpose for which the image was acquired. A good example of this, right? I just finished an article on um, CT-guided um, drainages. So we use a CT as a fluoro machine to place a drain inside of a patient who has like an abscess in their abdomen, right? I don't really need a really high quality pretty picture for that. And I especially don't need a really high quality pretty picture for that when you think that number one, the scanner's going to be zapped in the same place over and over again, and number two, there's going to be a doctor, nurse, and myself in the room while I'm doing that, right? So I can sacrifice some image quality because I want to decrease my dose and the doctor's dose and the patient's dose, right? So again, it depends on the purpose for which the image was acquired. If I'm doing a cancer study, right, if, or if, for instance, if I'm doing radiation therapy planning, go ahead and crank that thing up. You know, burn it out. You're going to be irradiating the area anyways. Overlap as much as you need to because eventually I've got to take that data set and send it over to the, the physicist and the dosimetrist and they're going to make their, uh, their 3D plan off of that data set, right? And I'm already going to be irradiating the heck out of that area. So, yes, have a, have a minimum pitch on that. Yes, have a crank up the mass on that. Get a really, really nice, pretty picture with full of spatial resolution, 
um, because you're going to need it for those 3D models, right? Um, so it, again, it goes back to its use and is it going to help us make an accurate diagnosis, okay? So we're going to think about those objective measures, right? We've already covered some of this, but the two main features that are used to measure image quality are spatial resolution or the ability to resolve um, size, particularly with really, really small objects, and contrast. And then contrast resolution is the ability to differentiate between objects that are very similar densities as their background. Okay? Um, there is also things that affect both of these would be SNR or signal to noise ratio because anytime we're taking pictures with someone there's going to be some amount of noise. There's going to be scatter, there's going to be artifacts, there's going to be a way that we need to differentiate between what was a good signal and what was noise, right? And then there's also going to be some contrast to noise ratio. There's going to be a we're going to have a difficult time trying to differentiate between are those actually high contrast structures or is there some kind of noise that's influencing the contrast between those images or those structures. Um, but again, spatial resolution is going to be tied right back to our pixel size, right back to the data, right? And it, the smaller the pixels, the higher our spatial resolution is going to be the better that those, that crystal technology, that receiver technology is able at differentiating different linear attenuation values, the better the contrast resolution is going to be, right? The better the algorithms are at getting rid of the noise in the, in the signal, the better the pictures are going to be. So let's break down spatial resolution just a little bit more. We might also call it detail resolution. Um, we are going to objectively measure it using water phantoms, right? Um, particularly line pair phantoms, and this is part of our weekly QA. This is actually in task 23. How does CTQA work, right? Um, well, here I'll tell you. Um, we're going to use some kind of data uh, analysis, typically a modulation transfer function. And this is used just a graphical representation of, this, of the system's performance, right? It's going to give us an actual readout that says that your system was performing in this way, this way, and this way at these different levels, right? And it's typically described in two dimensions. There's in-plane resolution, so that would be our XY within an image, right? Let me be able to, let me draw just a little bit here. So in-plane resolution is going to be within that, that XY coordinate system, right? I can see, say like there's a little, there's going to be these little lines on it, and I can see, oh, there's nice spatial resolution between those lines, right? Longitudinal resolution is going to be in the direction of the Z axis, right? So along that z-axis, what's the resolution here? What's the resolution here? What's the resolution here? Does that make sense? Okay. Factors affecting spatial resolution. Matrix size, there it is, number one. Display field of view, right? User-defined parameters. Matrix size is going to just be specific to that scanner, but I can affect pixel size, so I can affect spatial resolution by determining how big that field of view is. Pixels, because both those things relate directly to pixel size. And pixel size can, is going to dictate to me just how thick a slice I can have and, and not lose quality, right? Of course, there's also reconstruction algorithms. There's just how the computer does what it does with the information. Focal spot size, did Victor talk to you all a little bit about um, focal spot within the x-ray tube? Within the x-ray we have the x-ray tube, we have a cathode and an anode. A lot of times the cathode's drawn something like that, and the anode is going to be a spinning disk, and a lot of times it's drawn something like that. Right? Now we are going to have boy, that is like the worst drawing of a cathode ever. We're going to have two different cathode sizes here. We're going to have a bigger one and a small one. That determines my focal spot size, right? 
So the way that I'm making these x-rays, when they come off the big one, it's going to make a nice big spray of x-rays, right? Versus if I use the small one, it's going to make a nice thin spray of x-rays. That, how big that x-ray is, oh my goodness, it looks like I've drawn like a, something from Mars Attacks. Um, man. Go ahead and do this. I love you. Um, so, uh, depending on that focal spot size, that's going to directly affect my spatial resolution. Okay? Does that kind of make sense so far? Smaller focal spot size, better spatial resolution. Um, the pitch, so how much I move the, 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 the table with each scanner acquisition, again, ties right back into spatial resolution. It's going to eventually start to affect um, things like stair step at artifact on the pictures, and then patient motion. Tell these people to hold still. Demand that they hold still. Use your mommy voice or your daddy voice, right? You're going to hold still. Um, meet the patient where they're at to help them hold still. Don't threaten them. Okay. Contrast resolution. Um, or also, we might also call it low contrast det detectability or system sensitivity. I've always just called it contrast re resolution. It's going to mean that if I've got like a little... Let's draw some black dots. We're gonna, this is the way I'm going to objectively measure it on my little um, scanner uh, QA system stuff. I'm going to have one little dot that is uh, fairly low contrast. And then I'm going to have another little dot that's, that's pretty blacked out. right? And I'm going to actually do measurements to see how well the scanner can differentiate between these two um, structures. Right? One of the things that makes CT superior to a lot of other modalities is the fact that it can do contra contrast resolution like at depth. So going back to the CT guided drainage placement stuff, the thing that CT, back in the day in the 1980s, there was debate which, which modality should we be using for drainage placement, ultrasound, CT, fluoro. CT eventually became the modality of choice for drainage placement because of its ability to resolve contrast between one of these little infections pockets and bowel or something, something that looks just like it. Ditto with why we're doing PET CT fusion right now is because CT does a good job in differentiating in between the contrast of a, a, of a tumor, right, versus normal liver, for example. What PET brings to the picture is now I can also say, um, is that just a hemangioma or is that like really, really hot? There is, there is there some kind of metabolic process going on there that, that, that looks cancerous? Um, just by comparison, in film screen radiography, an object needs to be at least 25 or 5% difference in contrast from its background to be discernible. So when, we do, when I do a, an x-ray of someone's abdomen, for example, it's very difficult sometimes to really differentiate from, between the kidney and the background. Um, in CT images, it can be 0.5% of a contrast uh, variation can be discernible. So we are very accurately measuring linear attenuation within CT images. So we're going to use, again, phantoms. A lot of times the phantoms have water inside of them. Be aware that that water, is you do not want to drink the water that's inside of a CT phantom. It probably has nickel or some kind of metal inside of it, and it would probably make you fall over and puke, right? Um, so drinking barium may be a funny prank to do for students, but do not drink the CT water, water phantoms. Um, they contain objects of varying sizes, like that terrible drawing I did on the last page, right? And those small differences in small differences in density, right? Like anywhere from four to ten Hounsfield units from the background. We're going to scan that phantom, and then we're going to look at those objects and throw ROIs on those objects to measure and make sure that our scanner is still accurately differentiating those objects from the background, from the water. Why are we using water inside of these phantoms? This goes back to the very first day or so when we saw the crazy British guy that was walking around in the woods talking about CT scanners. Hounsfield units, right? Water is zero on the Hounsfield unit scale. So Hounsfield very generously gave us water because it's one of the most abundant things on this planet, 
And so we can use water in our phantoms, and then we know we're at a zero point. That water is a zero point. Anything other than that water is going to be either below or above zero, right? Um, noise is going to play an important role in low contrast resolution. We'll look at some pictures of the kind of noise that can contribute to us not being able to see what we need to see because of the noise. Noise is always going to be an undesirable fluctuation of pixel values, okay? Um, and it might have a salt and pepper or kind of a grainy look to it. Um, the shapes of those grainy looks can be different, okay? And, of course, the presence of noise on an image degrades the quality. That is pretty much the definition of noise. I guess unless you're talking about, like, bands like Sonic Youth. I like Sonic Youth. They're a noisy band. Um, the noise is part of the signal. So... Factors affecting contrast resolution. Mass or patient dose, pixel size, slice thickness. Are you all starting to see that all of this stuff is interconnected? Signal resolution, or, uh, um, I'm sorry. Spatial. Spatial resolution and contrast resolution are be very, very closely related. Okay, thank you. But notice one thing here, we've got patient size, right? Because at some point we've got, let's say we've got nice little skinny uh, me, uh, person and then, and then Ben Roberts, right? Um, what's going to happen as the x-ray is going through me, right, is it's going to start to get harder and harder and harder. And by that I mean that kilovolt peak, all of the other stuff that was less than the kilovolt peak is going to get attenuated, right? It's going to get stopped. But all the really heavy-duty stuff is just going to keep on powering through. And the machine is just picking up the heavy stuff, right? So that's going to eventually start to reduce my contrast. Or I, I should say increase the contrast. So other contrast re resolution considerations. So subject contrast. What is the size of the object? Are we talking about little tiny wrist bones or are we talking about like the liver? right? Inherent contrast. Things are going to have certain kinds of contrast just because of what they are. Like, number one thing I think about is the chest. The thorax has a lot of inherent or subject contrast, right? So I don't necessarily give, need to give the patient IV contrast because they've already got lungs and interstitial tissue and then bones and stuff. That's a pretty big difference between the negative Hounsfield range in the lungs versus the positive Hounsfield range in the ribs. And then display contrast. So we're going to use our window settings. We messed around with window width and level, and that's going to affect our display contrast. Just two more slides, two, three more slides. Temporal resolution. So this is, has to, go to, to do with time, how quickly the pictures were acquired. And this is going to be controlled by the gantry rotation, the number of detectors or channels in the scanner, and the speed with which the system can change the way it's recording different signals. Okay? and it's typically reported in milliseconds. All right, so let's do a quick review. The appropriate technique for a given patient examination was 200 masks. The technologist mistakenly used 100 masks. Which aspect of image quality would be most affected? Is it time, contrast, or spatial resolution? Any guesses? I believe y'all are right. Contrast resolution. Oh. We're all wrong. Insufficient mass will result in an increase in noise, which primarily affects contrast resolution. All right. Let's take a break. <laughs>